the fucking essence of being an artist, beyond all like the thinking and the great stuff about it, is making tiny repetitive lines over and over and over again for hours. That's what being an artist is. It's so much fucking donkey work, as well as you know the metaphysics and the ecstasy and all that bullshit. <laughs> Art is fucking boring to do all day, but that's how you make it. Molly Crabapple is a relentlessly prolific artist, writer, and activist. She's used her intrepid breed of illustrated journalism to document some of the most pivotal moments of the last decade, from the Ferguson riots to Syria's civil war. While Molly's early work explored the romantic underworld of New York's burlesque scene, her art took a decisive turn in the wake of the 2008 financial collapse and the fury of Occupy Wall Street. She's also just published a memoir, Drawing Blood, that tells the story of her evolution into what many have called one of the most influential artists of our time. I wanted to understand the drive behind Molly's eclectic life and career, so I accepted her offer of drawing lessons at her live-in studio in Manhattan's financial district. So I am not going to torture you by forcing you to draw with um, some sort of dripping medium or something that you have to dip. We are going to start with the finest of Mr. Oh, Sketch Smelly Markers. This brings me back to elementary school. My big wisdom to impart with drawing is that it's better to do the wrong line with confidence and style than it is to do the right line with hesitation and tentativeness. Okay, I think that's probably really challenging for <laughs> a beginner, but I will, well, I will do my best. So to... I guess what I mean is like, well, let's say I'm drawing Sarah. I'm so objectifying you. Objectify <laughs> me all you want, baby. I never get the right line first, so I just sort of sketch where her head is. I can like draw the line down the center of it. I, I draw her super, super cool hair. And then you sort of start by sketching in these um, loose, loose shapes of stuff. Everyone has all sorts of preconceptions about what things look like. Like you think you know what a strawberry looks like, what a nose looks like. But if you take those preconceptions to a drawing, you're gonna draw everything wrong. It's not gonna look like her, right? You know, you're kinda, gonna kinda break it down to angles and planes and you're gonna try to look at it as much as it is rather than as what you think it is. <laughs> Not too terrible. I think it does resemble you. I like it a lot. Molly's book, Drawing Blood, traces her life in New York City and the development of her artistic voice, a new milestone in the evolution of her craft. Your memoir, which is sort of like a collection of essays meets memoir. Kind, kind of, a collection of na more narrative essays about my life. Like, how did that process go for you? Writing has never not been hard for me. It's never not been the hardest thing for me. And I don't think you can learn to even write a book until you do it. So the first thing I did was I got a hotel room for myself. I love hotel rooms. And I got a big old bottle of whiskey and a big bottle of this compressed coffee thing that <laughs> works really well. And I locked myself in there for three days and I was like, I'm not leaving until I write 20,000 words. And they can be the shit word, they could be shit words. I can write all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. I don't care, but I have to write 20,000 words. I viewed writing like creating this giant block of marble that I was then gonna like take out all the crap parts and until something good and real remained. And for you, what role do the illustrations play or what effect do the illustrations have on the words on the words on the illustrations? It's an interesting thing because art grabs you in a way that writing can't because writing you have to read it. You have to make an equal effort with it whereas art it just jumps into your eyes. But art always is also kind of pointing and signaling whereas writing can say something explicitly. I like art because it shows that care was bestowed on something. One of my favorite projects is a collaboration I have with a young Syrian writer, Marwan Hisham, that I did for Vanity Fair, where he was sending me cell phone photos from Raqqa. Syria is a country with, where a lot of people have cameras on their phones, and there has been a lot of documentation, a lot of media activism, um, a lot of the worst things that you can ever see in the world. All of that visual horror has done very little, I think, to um, interest anyone in the West in it. In fact, perhaps it's, perhaps it's off-putting, it's just too hard to look at. Part of what I tried to achieve is I wanted to show, like, no, this is worth looking at. This is, this is something I spent time on. I spent a lot of time on this. You, know, you should look. Before Occupy Wall Street, and a lot of my work was about sex and nightlife, and beautiful women, I felt like if I included politics in my artwork, it would be sort of this preachy lie. And so I would do it kind of, I would hide the critique beneath the ruffles, I guess. And then when Occupy happened, 
I felt, no, man, no, I'm being cowardly if I'm not, if I'm not explicit. Like, this is a time to take sides, and I wanted to take sides. It was this time of ferment and excitement, though also a lot of fucked up things, too, and it made me not just do political work, but also do all sorts of work that I would have formerly not given myself permission to do and even have been afraid to do. There's always this really boring model for artists, which is that you just stay in your studio and you create increasingly exquisite objects for rich people until you die. And then someone makes a lot of money off of them. And this model for artists is so limiting. I wanted artists that were engaged in the world. I, I didn't want us just to be these sort of mute savants. I wanted us, I wanted us to be, you know, an intrinsic part of everything. And when you have this time when like people, people are marching, people are protesting, your friends are getting arrested, and you just want to chronicle it, and you want to chronicle it fast. Like, it feels so urgent. I grew up totally obsessed with toulouse Lautrec. He was the house artist of the Moulin Rouge. He chronicled sex workers in Paris with more empathy and more solidarity than I ever even would think a man was capable of. He drew all of the ambition and power and venom, just that sort of like amoral greed for life and that rejection of all categories and boundaries and all of the harsh things in scenes that are supposed to be totally frou-frou, like a fucking can-can hall. You have really been immersed in that community of sex work. Is that a big part or is that something that's like not important at all? It actually really influenced my thinking because like, okay, let's say you're a middle-class white chick. There's this idea that society will protect you that um, you have like a sort of innocence and virtue and that that should be unsullied. Even if you sleep around, there's still that, that idea, right? That you're like a special flower and society will protect you and you can go to the police and they'll help you. And once you do sex work, you throw that out. Uh, if I had gotten raped during a shoot in a hotel room, I couldn't go to the cops for that, my dear God. Like, not, they would have laughed at me. And I think that there's something very good about burning your good girl privilege. Male virtues were like being brave or loyal or chivalrous, you know, going out into the battle, um, being upright, protecting other people, doing, they're active, right? And the woman's virtue is not having sex. That, that is what a woman's <laughs> virtue meant. It's, a, it's, it's totally about negation. And I think that when you burn that, when you burn the, that ideal of negation about yourself and you're like, okay, fine, I'm not unsullied anymore. I don't have a fucking clean Google record. I'm not pure then you can start thinking in a more active way. And what power do you think that gives you? It does give you freedom. Because you've, you've taken something that people said was valuable about you, but were ultimately society was just using to kind of chain you, and you've said, fuck that. Maybe it's a myth, or maybe for some people it's a reality in our culture of the artist sort of just like creating silently and freely in their studio with no actual, um, you know, strife or paying rent or any of the sort of like because mundane. Because they have a parent that's paying for everything. I mean, like, how the fuck is their gallery owner going to discover them? What do they think that fucking gallery owners are just like going around studios in poor neighborhoods waiting to discover people? That's not how it works. The people who get discovered by galleries are discovered because they were getting an MFA at Yale, and then then that hooked them up with a gallery. Your work has always been work to you in some respects. How has that sort of changed what you've created, or has it? Well, for one thing, it means that I'm not one of those fucking artists that's sitting around saying, oh, I'm waiting for the muse to come to me. I don't believe that. I, I know sometimes the muse comes to you. Sometimes the muse like, comes and makes love to you, and it's amazing. But if you're not spending all of your other time like sharpening your craft, then when the muse comes, you're just going to create crap. Guantanamo is such a difficult place to be a photographer because they have these operational security guidelines that make it like you're playing Twister. You can shoot the scene, but you can't get anyone's heads, and you can't get more than one door, and you can't get any cameras, and you can't get a certain number of building structures. There is stuff that, like, f that photographers just they couldn't get. For instance, um, photographers aren't allowed in the courtroom. There are no images of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed that the public gets out except what me and Janet Hamlin and several other artists have done, there are no images of the Guantanamo War Court in photo photography whatsoever. Me and a few other artists who have been there were providing really the only visuals of a lot of Guantanamo Bay at all because I couldn't draw people's faces because I was banned from that. I didn't want to just like draw everyone's backs and make, make it seem like it was a coincidence. So what I did was I drew these masks, like smiley faces but with a neutral expression. That was my way of making that censorship very, very explicit. Do you think about like the role that your type of journalism plays sort of like in the media landscape? I think that we're living in an incredibly exciting time for journalism in general. You have 
deep dives of Raqqa based on cell phone photos and, and interviews with refugees. You have people doing the most impersonal, data-driven stuff based on crowdsourced images from the internet. We live in a time of everything. We live in a time of multiplicity, and I think that if, insofar as my stuff plays into that landscape, it's the fact that journalism is now looks like everything. There's no one way it looks. Do you ever have those moments still of, of like, block or anxiety or inability to move forward? In visual art, at least, I found that the answer to that was to work so hard that you kind of broke and to just sort of empty everything out that was cliched about you and then something else emerges.